This is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. I'm Grace Cavalieri, and we are on remote. Paul Bartlett is here with us. He is a writer. He is one of the top chefs in Baltimore. He has a rich literary and culinary career. And let us hear a poem from the new book. Hi, everybody. The first poem is called Never Enough. Along this chosen road, passing Walmart, traffic pattern flowing like a salmon or shad run, charging upstream to spawning grounds, heedless of obstacles and roundabouts, drawn along on a mission like magnet to the north, endless passage on the path of progress leading to exhaustion in the end, no atonement. Rebirth is each breath taken, a lucky breath, a lucky break. Time is given, the mighty surge of life, the ghost of history, each vital sign, a detail of perfection and destruction. We ride the giant wave, curling toward landfall in a tailspin of certainty. Paul Bartlett lives in Baltimore and farms in West Virginia. His life is about growing food and creating restaurants and serving the hungry of Baltimore. He's the author of six chapbooks and two full length poetry collections. And this new book, Kite, what is the title? Kite Tail Streamers. Streamers. Kite Tail Streamers. We'll find out about the inspiration for that. But Paul is um, someone, a poet I've watched I've watched his poetry from when he was a very young man, maybe 45 years ago. And I have been very interested in seeing that his voice is like his content. He is the, a person who, who goes through the streets of Baltimore, through the country roads of America, seeing, observing, reporting out what he sees. He's a traveler. He's always on the road again. Is that a good way to describe your work? Yeah. Yep, that you all go along and observe and report out to the world what you see. And you're known for remarking about the changes in Baltimore. Say a little bit about that. Well, as a former student at Antioch College, um, I've always focused on soci sociological aspects of social interactions. Which is what Antioch was all about. And in my poetry, I focus on um, the mystery between the parts and the whole of things, you know, um, kind of, and I go back to early influences of, in that era of the here and now philosophy of Allen Ginsberg and Alan Watts and those sort of people. Um, but also in, in my poetic um, mentorship. I've always enjoyed the work of people like Charles Reznikoff and Louis Zukofsky and uh, William Carlos Williams and uh, Walt Whitman. They're, they're very, they're tellers of stories objectively mm. of what goes on in front of them. And then um, from that, there's kind of, you can draw your own conclusions about um, what we know and how we get there. So well said, because you are always dealing with the concrete and the basic, but it's always symbolizing something more. It's about change. It's about the past. It's about what is remembered. But you always start with the thing itself, the road sign, the, the rusty fence, the brook by the side of the road. So you start with a definite, tangible thing and that becomes a symbol of passage, I think. You're all about passage. Do you agree? That's really interesting, yeah. Uh, thank I'm you. here to tell you what you're about. <laughs> no, I think it's great. <laughs> it is so true. Let's hear another poem. Okay, um, the second one is called Waterman. Um, I don't need to introduce it. I will read it. And then if you want to talk about it, I'll tell you some stuff. Waterman, 
John Wal John Walton. It's an it's a um, a eulogy, I suppose. Is that the correct word? It's um it's a story about a person. John Walton told a tale from the bridge, looking out on the water, traveling the world, weather and wake of time passing. I'd call at four in the morning for hard crabs and learn a story of flagged tankers plying the waters of Lake Maracaibo or the history of Adrian Hansen's dog. There was never a time I didn't hear Mary cheerfully holding her part, worrying about John's optimism in the face of worsening weather. Over the years, the calls got fewer. I'd have to pull over to the side of the road and just talk for a while. The matter of fact telling of circumstance, more dire each call. Then oyster and crab deliveries began trickling in from Joe Rafferty or Captain Seaweed. And instead of stories from John, we'd hear stories of John. Mm -hmm. Now sad faces of loss call each other just to say, hey, did you hear the story? <laughs> yes, that is, uh, I, I like that very much because it is a portrait of a person that we get to know. So you have created someone who never existed before and who will now never die, which is what Yay. I love about poetry. Poetry preserves the beloved. And that is one thing that poem does. But the most interesting thing to me was you waiting at the docks for the oysters and the crabs. Would you talk about the life of a chef? We think you start in the kitchen, but you start at the docks waiting for the crabs to come in. Talk about that. That's true. It's very true. Um, um, I think I wrote this about a period of time when I was um, the chef at Philip Seafood Restaurants. And um, I had set up a venue on Baltimore Harbor called the Crab Deck. And, we, and every day we needed fresh crabs. So at four in the morning, I would call John. John is, comes from a long, uh, long lineage of um, watermen on, um, good Lord. Is that a dying breed, waterman? Well, if you remember James Michener's book, Chair, uh, Chesapeake, Yes. Um, the watermen are the people who hunt and fish and gather on the eastern shore of Maryland. And John is an, was one of the people who aggregated those catches. The Phillips family, for example, um, they ran by boats, which would go between the different fishing boats and pick up their catch and bring them to the dock. And then someone like John brings them to Baltimore and gives them to those of us who order, if we order in time. So you got to get there at four in the morning when he's checking out what's going on and who, what's coming in and so forth. Little people, little do not know really how arduous a chef's life must be and what psychosis you have to enter to be in that life. You say you have a long involvement with the Chesapeake. What does that mean? Well, um, as a chef, it's mostly with the bounty and beauty of the Chesapeake. You know, I'm, I'm really more involved with the seafood and getting it to market, bring, bring, bringing, it to mar bringing it to restaurants, preparing it and serving it to people. But you and also say you have a special relationship to oysters, which I think. I <laughs> yeah, I'm an oyster shucker. I <laughs> joined the Legion of Maryland's heirloom oyster shuckers. <laughs> and, and you say you, once you told me that you got the taste from the oyster from swimming in the Atlantic as a boy. And every time you swam, every time you taste an oyster, you remember those swimming days. Right. Am I remembering right. correctly? No, that's, it's perfect. It's like, you know, getting a mouthful of salt water when you get tumbled by a wave. <laughs> and that's what remember you remember when you taste an oyster. Well, you're very famous for many things in Baltimore. You're a legend in Baltimore. You're also a literary figure. So let's be literary and give us a poem. Okay. Um, I think the third one we're doing is about food. It's about um, the work in the kitchen. It's called At Work. Let me try this with glasses. We begin smoking about 7.30. Fires light up. 
and movement, pace, in search of order, shoulders on in loud fashion through the kitchen. No music, but voices calling out in percussion of pots and plates. Water hits the pan, fire rolls its tongue, tastes oil, flames spit, feel and taste with your eyes. Texture in your hands, colors dance against hard black and stainless surface, contrast with your mind. The job is work. There's a way to do it. There is grace, there is power, perfection and satisfaction. The fish is fresh. The beans are crisp. The rolls have risen. There is precision in the kitchen. Seasons perfectly ripe, sugar plums, emerald kiwis, doughs cool to the touch and smooth as a drum. Deadlines, mm. call them lines drawn in sand, the silken rolling boil of demigloss, the poetry of a proper menu, the flow of cash and smiles. Do you use flavor enhancers on your fruit? asked the German woman at the World Trade Center. <laughs> Tight, ripe clusters of red flame grapes on still green stems nestled in 18 pound wooden crates, stacked six foot high beside Thompson and Revere while Concords rest with raspberries and paper wrapped fat and sexy sweet carambola in the fancy fruit room. Oh, tomatoes, sweet. Fetid, cloying, overripe, soft and splitting, ready for the marinara pot. Descriptions, just descriptions. Pages filled with stiff and shining golden eyed rock bass and cool blue black periwinkles and perfectly golden yellow sacks of sea urchin row glistening in shiny spherical shell. My hands tumble the ocean in a box of mussels the heady pungence of crabs, fresh from their sauna of vinegar and beer. I ask the lobster before me, where do you come from, crustacean? Gills, breathing in air like a mammal, delicate cilia rhythm, 10 arms, two claws, and a powerful tail. A quiver and twitching in numb lethargy as the steaming pot comes to a boil on the stove. I remove the rubber bands, deep, blue-green bulging eyes and long antenna. Every limb moves in anticipation. Roasted bones with garlic, sauteed onions and fresh thyme, a full nose of cracked pepper and degloss of burgundy. The romance of bouquet, a fine stock, a silken sauce. The sensual zone, alluring, push and pull of production. Come on boys, we got 25 top rounds to cut and roast. 300 chickens to quarter and 25 hams made ready and glazed. It's 40 boxes of oysters to haul and a beer truck still to meet. Let's move, we're down to 36 hours. Oh, <laughs> you, you have said it all. That is no right. one knows why anyone goes into that profession. It is only because of the pure sensuality of it. And the sensuality in your kitchen is a sensuality in your poetry. I want everyone to know some of the things you've done. You serve crab cakes to the governor on the shore of the bay. I could tell that story. It's a funny. You cut fish in our city's markets and shucked oysters at the St. Mary's County Fairgrounds in October and won the Maryland Crab Cooking Olympics held at Lexington Park in Baltimore. And in many years, you've represented Maryland in Hollywood and San Francisco in behalf of the mayor and the governor. You are our top chef. Oh, come on. That is years <laughs> ago. <laughs> it is just, I, I'd like to talk a little bit, extend a metaphor for about the ingredients in food and the ingredients in poetry. How do you gather your ingredients in poetry? Do you carry a little notebook in your apron all day? And as you go on your motorcycle, yes. scribble? Is that what you do? Sure. Okay, talk about the way you see, aha, uh -huh. proof, there's visual aids. Tell the way you see the world, the colors, the tastes, the smells, you see the world as you see the kitchen. Talk about your approach to life. Mm. Your senses are everything to you. 
Yeah, they really are. They're very important. And your skills. I saw you cut a, 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 a lamb. It was dead, fortunately. But I saw you cook, uh, cut a cooked lamb. And the skill with a knife is something we also have to talk about. Can a chef be a chef if they don't have dexterity? No, the, the whole fire and knives things is really important. I think that's why a lot of the kids who wanted to be um, lead guitar players in the 60s and 70s became chefs in the 80s and 90s. Oh, how it's, interesting. It's because you, got, you have waitresses. You have fire, you have knives, you have all this stuff that happens in compressed time frames. And then at the end of it, it's like, hey, it's done. I don't have to worry about this till tomorrow. <laughs> but what are the, the abuses that happen as a sous chef and you're chopping onions and you're screaming, yes, chef, yes, chef. The, what do you it's really have to go through? The rings, under a refrigerator. the rings of fire, Paul. The rings of fire that you have to go through to become a, a really the leader in the kitchen. Could you, did you ever say, why am I taking this abuse? Yeah. Every time <laughs> I was cleaning out a refrigerator at one in the morning. <laughs> oh, I want a memoir from you in the worst way. Let's have another poem. Okay. Um, I, I think the title of it is Cleaning Out a Refrigerator at One in the Morning. That's your memoir. That's an interesting title. You know, uh, Anthony Bourdain is an interesting guy, too. He wrote about all this stuff. He did. And don't, why do you think Wonderful. he was so dogged, dogged by pain? Well, drugs are one thing, I guess. That's a demon he couldn't shake, right? That's a demon, so, yeah, a lot of people have trouble. You know, I've had more, um, I've had more band members in my kitchen, people who couldn't make a living as playing, and playing music. I mean, I, in the beginning, I wanted to write poetry and I absolutely knew I couldn't make a living at it. And that was one of the reasons that I really focused on the kitchen because I could travel and find a meal in every town and I could get hired in every town. It's, you know. That's interesting, but you did train and there is something called craft in cooking and craft in poetry. Oh yeah, well the problem, you're not gonna go anywhere unless you get your craft together. How many years in the making of study do you think that took and apprenticing yourself? Well, the, the knowledge in the profession is it takes about nine years to develop the skills of being a competent chef in a busy operation. And that period of time, you have to learn so many different disciplines. You start with food, but then you have to be able to manage people. You have to be able to organize things. Then you have to be able to do that in a cost-effective manner that allows the restaurant or the food service operation to survive. And you also have to be aware of the seasons and what's available. And you have to write menus that appeal to people who will come to your place in order to eat. It's, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the faint of heart. Let's have another poem. This is called The Imagining. It's kind of long, but I hope you'll bear with me. It's only three pages. Okay. My audience is very sophisticated. I love to noodle a little bit on the guitar and uh, one of my favorite idioms is the old blues. And I start this off with, you know, the old blues are things that morph with everybody who plays them. So mm -hmm. one of the lines that sticks around forever is, I'm a stranger here, just got to your town. The young investment bankers are staying in a fifth floor walk-up billed as Hotel Toshi at the corner of Rivington and Pitt. No names on the mailboxes, seven blocks to the subway. Tall, handsome, and full of expectation in their gray suits, striding across Lexington Street to the glass-chambered high-rise for the first day of work. Work trucks hustle down 2nd Avenue. Sedan cars wait by the curb. On Grand Street, a hand truck loaded with six 40-pound boxes passes on my left. Behind me, a hand-pushed vending cart waits for the light. New York City is dense, multi-use space. Close proximity does not imply or require interaction. 
lights, crosswalks, bike lanes, and riders jockey for position. Essex Street Market is dingy, low ceiling, filled with vendors selling meats and fish, cheese and produce, and something more on the thoroughfare bustle of neighborhood life. Schiller's Liquor Bar down the block hosts espresso drinkers, French doors open to the noonday sun. By the cellar stair, a man argues with another how to get a 40 pound wheel, Parmigiano Reggiano, through the door. Around the corner, past San Barzano brick oven pizza, the hardware store, bagels and locks, Guinness at Donnybrook, Atlas Bakery, a new cafe, eight tables full with earnest young laptop workers. Next door, Shari Bicycle Company builds handcrafted frames. Fried oyster tacos at a sidewalk stand. Mini flour tortillas beneath a bed of shredded lettuce. <laughs> then crispy bivalves coated with breadcrumbs and cornmeal, chopped leaves of cilantro, avocado sliced on top. Then a drizzle of chipotle remoulade to top things off. Girls and boys on the concrete playground at PS 140, Nathan Strauss, fast pitch softball for the girls, hard hits, hoops for the boys. Spanish and black, the chicas are loud with sing-song chants before every pitch. Wow, what a catch. On the next court, Chinese boys play badminton without a net. <gasps> While a young girl rides her push scooter around and across the court as they play. On the bench near me at the fence by the scooter girl's father, a couple of teens, one European, one Puerto Rican, each with electric guitar cases in hand, lost in a reverie of musical thought, philosophy of play and theory of composition in the afternoon sun. Around the young girl, on a scooter and two guys playing badminton without a net. A couple of young black boys ride their bikes in figure eights under a sign on the fence which reads, don't honk, $350 penalty. <laughs> <laughs> there we have the historian, the chef, the poet as historian, because what you love to do is to take the past and freeze it in time on the page. This is a recollection. This is, you catch change in midair because you've been in Baltimore so many years, maybe 50 years. Mm -hmm. I don't, you weren't even born here, were you? No, no. But I'm when a did you, from the North. I'm a when did you come to Baltimore? Um, in around 1970, early 70. Okay, so that's 45 or so years. Mm -hmm. And so, from that time, you have been fascinated with watching storefronts change, watching roads change, and you have uh, memorialized these in your poetry in that you love the past, but you catch it as if it's on its way somewhere and you just freeze it there. What does the past of Baltimore mean to you that, that makes you so passionate about saving it? Um, it's the context that got us to where we are. You know, it's, um, if you don't know the past, I don't think you can really understand what you're seeing in front of you. But once again, you use basic and concrete examples always. Storefronts, names of food, you know. Well, they all, all those things evoke sensations in us one way or another, whether it's smells or tastes or touch or memories. Mm -hmm. And if you're very much in the school of William Carlos Williams, where it's the thing itself, the image is itself tells the story. And he certainly, in works like Patterson, he certainly explores his environment and its history. That's true. And you're going to continue to do that forever. But I need to let people know um, the other, both facets of you. One is that you can, you are a consultant. Yes. A top chef consultant. People come to you, you create with your clients restaurants from the ground up, from the building to the look of it, to the menus, to the concept, like a magician, like a magician. Is no, that like fun? an assistant? Is it fun? 
the magician's I'm, assistant. Yeah, I'm the center. I'm kind of like um, the, the hub of the wheel. And then the wheel goes around. But I, I kind of connect the pieces. Is it fun for you to go in to see the finished product and look at people eating and think that your thought form started this? Um, yeah, certainly if I'm at the table, but my focus is always on supporting the chef. I mean, I'm a back of the house person. And when I operate in a restaurant, I'm operating from the chef's perspective. I'm the chef's other person. As a consultant. Yeah. I, yeah. I, that, I don't do bars. I, you know, I don't do dining rooms. Not, I, those are auxiliary to me. I have designers who do that and bar people and wine specialists. I'm the kitchen. I love you. I have bar keepers that do that. I have, it sounds like a little empire, but I would like to talk about the goodness you do in working so hard to get children food in Baltimore. And what is that program? Well, it's called Good Harvest. It's a, a, a program of St. Vincent de Paul of Baltimore. It used to be called Kids Table. We've rebranded recently. And we feed um, in pre-COVID times, you know, we feed the after-school programs, the um, city rec centers, uh, Head Start programs, um, all the shelters. And we've done this all through COVID as well, but everything has moved from congregate feeding where we have groups sitting down together to eat to individual bags and boxes that go mm. to people, you know, who line up for two and a half miles in high school parking lots and <sighs> a box with six meals in it. Um, I do, I've been working with Kids Table with Good Harvest for um, I think seven or eight years now. And I was brought in to manage their recipe and, and, organi and ingredient databases. But shortly after I got there, the chef left. So um, I kind of took I, over I the basics for it. I write the menus and I write the recipes. Well, I, where do you them. get the, where do you order the food and where do you cook the food? Well, we have, we have a facility just over the city line in Rosedale, which is um, located right where the old Hollander Ridge um, um, tenement housing was. And, you know, the great society housing of the 60s in Rosedale. There's uh, another that, poem, another poem. That's Rosedale. the next one I'm gonna read, right? Yeah. I mean, well, that, that's about this place. Oh, marvelous. Okay, we run, I wanna hear it. We run eight trucks twice a day and we feed, uh, pre-COVID we were doing almost 50,000 meals a week. Now we're at around 30,000. May I say, no matter what your religion, may God bless you. I really mean that with all my heart. May God bless you. All those children, all those children you have fed. If you counted heads, would it be 100,000 maybe? Pardon me? If you counted heads, it could oh, no, be. It's, it, those are, it's a finite number of people. It's just they're eating every day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. So who no, gets to qualify for these foods? Um, there are often people who are involved in social service programs. You know, like people who are in, um, the adults are in, are in shelters. Um, the kids are, you know, like the Sarah's Hope houses and things like that, where family shelters, um, with something like Parkville High School or Lock Raven High School, you know, it's, it's um, called um, the Summer Foods Service Feeding. Okay. And this is part let of the Care Act. And let so us on. shift from the great mercy of your life to the great mercy of the page and hear a poem. Okay, I think the next one we're doing is called A New Song Where the Roads Meet. And this is actually about the geography and so forth of where I'm sitting here at, at kids table. I don't know if that's important. A new song where the roads meet. Once, before the land cut, even before the poor tenant housing on Hollander Ridge, Back Creek flowed toward the waters of Chesapeake Bay. Generations passed. Now every bluff is served by 18 wheel trucks. Light industry covers land between off ramps and old carriage roads of mid Atlantic coastal cities. Now chain link fences lead over past concrete to abutments where the sidewalk ends and billboards stake ground 
to proclaim evidence of God found in the face of a newborn child. No doubt this is true. On one side of the street, the house of praise has redeemed an old shopping center, complete with worship center, school, congregational gathering space, and parking for hundreds of souls. Recently, a security patrol has been added. How we knew what was there and then, knowledge gleaned from pathways beaten down with passing years, markers of common heritage, diluted by the whoosh of wild free running change. So dry, it sounds like paper in dry wind, thoughts not anchored to purpose, lost to fleeting circumstance, longing to settle the hunger for completion, sharing what time there is to share, the arc of passage in every eye unique. Thoughts not anchored to purpose, thoughts not anchored to purpose. Um, I want you to, to say the list of people who taught you different foods. Well, this is part of the long- Your gold form. standard. This is a like a- pro bio, but this, I was trained in French kitchens. So uh, the references, and you know, interestingly enough, James Beard once said that Baltimore was one of the five great restaurant, great food cities in the United States. And of course that's true. They are, you know, New York, Baltimore, New Orleans, San Francisco, and Chicago. Um, Baltimore is on that list because of the Chesapeake Bay. It's because of 300 years of uh, immigration of people from Europe and all of their patterns, the Poles and the French and the Germans and everything. And, um, and we've got America in miniature with all the cattle and lamb and cheeses and everything from Western Maryland and all the Eastern shore truck farms with their melons and silver queen corn and all that stuff. Maryland is great. As the years passed, my heroes multiplied. I was taught the gold standard for crab cakes by Nancy Devine at Fadley's at Lexington Market and learned bouillabaisse from Maurice Martique on Mulberry Street. I learned Coquille Saint-Jacques from Fernand Tercigo at Papillon in Ellicott City and Lobster Thermidor from Danny Dickman on Biddle Street. Oysters Rockefeller and Crab Imperial I picked up at the old Eager House. And how to stab an oyster from Vernon Johnson and George Hastings at some VFW or volunteer fire hall on a Great Bay River. <laughs> oh my, do these people know they're being on the Hall of Fame? <laughs> No. This is great. Well, we have not paid enough attention to you as a literary figure for the past 40 years. And I just want to have a few remarks about what you've done with the Maryland Writers Council and your Red Door Hall poetry and performance venue and the, the literary newsletter that you put out, Hard Crabs. You were at the hub of the literary world and continue to do. Just give us a moment about that life. That was a long time ago. It was um, in the 70s and early 80s. And it was a very lively scene. Uh, we started uh, at 16 West Franklin Street with letter presses and Elliot Coleman and uh, Bob Waldman and Andre Kudrescu and Roger Burnett mm. and a bunch of those folks. And we moved to um, Christ Church at the corner of um, St. Paul Street and Chase Street. And they had a marvelous, incredible hall in the back of it, which we named the Red Door Hall. And we put on plays and had poetry readings and so forth. We had Ricky Lights from the Gullah community in South Carolina. We had Lawrence Ferlinghetti from City Lights and we had uh, Ed Sanders read there. We had a lot of really good people read there. And um, it, we could fit 150 people in that hall. It was fantastic. So the Maryland Writers Council, when I was the administrator there, we were in the, in the throes of um, mayor's arts and, um, you know, there was some funding from the city for activities like that. I took advantage of that. But we published a literary newsletter to kind of keep the community together. 
back then we had to, you know, take camera shots of it, burn it on plates, get Stephen Weiss to run his press for free for us. You know, that's the way literature happens. That is totally the way it happens. Then, like cream, it rises to the top. It was wonderful. We did it for a lot of for a few years. We were actually archived at the University of Buffalo. I believe that people will know more about you if they ever read this book and your other previous books. So let us have a final poem. Okay, um, good enough. <clears throat> this one is um, the title of the book. It's called Kite Tail Streamers. Those are those things that help balance the kite once it's in flight. A gust of levity is in the air, the kite held tight behind, you on the run, whipped back and forth before you let it go, can fly on wild breeze. It cuts through passing time, tossed about by circumstance, roiling in the change of early spring, kite tail streamers, culled from passing fancy, high above the hand and string, dancing on the air. The voice of Paul Bartlett, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite poets. And this Thank is you. the program, The Poet and the Poem. The series is produced by Forest Woods Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funding is provided by the Sinipid Fund. I am Grace Cavalieri and our engineer is Mike Turpin.